start the stream. We'll back up. We will figure this all out. Thank you, folks, for your patience as you listen live. Uh, we will get there. Bear with us uh, one second, folks. Yes, we have. Uh, we managed to have two people uh, watch. Okay. All right. So, uh, picking up where we left off. Pardon the interruption, as it were. I think that's trademarked. <laughs> Tony Kornheiser is going to be on. So, here. look, big night uh, for Democrats. I think people thought it was possible, but highly unlikely that the Democrats would take the governorship in Kentucky. Donald Trump was there just two nights ago. Not last night, but the night before, on the eve of the election. Rand Paul showed up and threatened to out the whistleblower. In fact, I think he probably did in some fashion. Um, Matt Bevin was there. Tea Party guy. The guy who wanted to get rid of Obamacare. The expansion of Medicaid. The guy who uh, assaulted teachers in Kentucky. So much so that they, they kicked off this red state revolt that took place last year. Love those three words together. Indeed. And here is Donald Trump going in. He's got the read the transcript t-shirts behind him. This is all about Trump and all about impeachment. He is bringing the full force. This is a state he won by 30 points in 2016. Do you understand that? 30 points. A national landslide in this country is considered three points. He won in Kentucky by 30 points. Here he is two nights ago explaining to the, the, the citizens of Kentucky the import of this election. The ones who voted for him 30 percent. Go ahead. You're sending that big message to the rest of the country. It's so important. You got to get your friends. You got to vote. Because if you lose, it sends a really bad message. It just sends a bad, and they will build it up. Here's the story. If you win, they're going to make it like ho-hum. And if you lose, they're going to say, Trump suffered the greatest defeat in the history of the world. This was the greatest. You can't let that happen to me. Well, they did. And Trump suffered the greatest defeat in the history of the world. Uh, they did let it happen. And, um, and, and there it is. Uh, Donald Trump um, loses. Let's hear Andy Bashir declaring victory in Kentucky last night. Matt Bevin has um, yet to uh, concede, uh, but he's also a tremendous jerk. Understand that Andy Bashir's dad was governor in uh, Kentucky. In fact, was he the one who oversaw the expansion of uh, of Medicaid and the exchanges there. They called it um, Connect or something. So I can't remember exactly. They, they did not brand it Obamacare because they knew. And uh, Bevin assaulted it. And Bashir ran on, on obviously the expansion of Medicaid and support for teachers. Now, this is Kentucky. So he's not going to come out and talk about... Um, you know, uh, Medicare for all and uh, free college for people. Maybe he should, uh, but we'll see. Yeah. But um, he, again, still has a Republican legislature. But uh, here he is um, talking about the big victory, which is really, as Donald Trump said, the greatest loss that Donald Trump could suffer in the history of the world. Tonight... Voters in Kentucky sent a message loud and clear for everyone to hear. It's a message that says our elections don't have to be about right versus left. They are still about right versus wrong. We believe in lifting each other up instead of tearing each other down. And here in Kentucky, 
we can still fight from the very top levels of government for every family, including the lost, the lonely, and the left behind. Um, a lot of like sort of, um, I don't want to say pablum, but it's, it's pablum in many respects. Um, but the reality is that um, you're going to see teachers get a lot more support in Kentucky. Their pension is not going to be under assault. You're going to see um, Medicaid become more generous in Kentucky. So more people are going to get health care. So if, if we got to swallow a little bit of pablum that you could literally fit in to any election in any country at any time, you could even probably drop it into multiple television shows and randomly. And that type of stuff is going to work. It's meaningless. But the real meaning is that there's going to be material benefit for people. And um, it's going to. Um, here's here's Bashir also. Giving a shout out to the unions. This is Tonight, good stuff to be heard there. I, I want to say thank you to our union families that helped make this election happen. So, that matters. Yeah. I, do you know what this guy's politics are specifically? Like, is he a John Ossoff type or is he more of a progressive? I, I mean, I would be shocked if he was... Um, what we would call a progressive on 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 most things because because what this says to me is that if a boring like a regular liberal can win in kentucky i think a real progressive stands an even better chance i mean i maybe uh but i don't know i don't know what the basis of that is it's possible but um you need a tremendous amount of support from uh, not just the voters, but from the apparatus there. And uh, I don't know. Maybe it's possible down or, the road. I mean, if your dad has to overcome the apparatus, if your dad was a former governor, you might have a lot more leeway to come out for something like Medicare for all. I frankly. think that's uh, a big part of it. I, I mean, mean, Matt Bevin was uniquely um, hated, you know, and Mitch McConnell, I don't think, I mean, look, I think Mitch McConnell can't feel good about this. But I also don't think that Mitch McConnell is terribly, you know, worried about it necessarily. I mean, perhaps insofar as um, there is certain apparatus that are now going to be in control of, of Democratic hands. Uh, but there was a couple of elements that led to this. Um, but yes, I the, the idea that progressives might do better than uh, non-progressives and uh, many places, it's possible. Well, especially in a place like Kentucky. I mean, if you want to sort of nationalize this to the 2020 race, um, I emailed Tom from Trillbillies yesterday looking for some comment on what we were talking about with regards to Kentucky and red states and, you know, persuasion versus turnout, non-voters, et cetera. And he pointed out that I don't think this is a controversial point, right? Trump isn't picking up any new voters in Kentucky or probably anywhere in 2020. If anything, he's losing a little bit of support. Why, probably. Do you, why is that uh, not controversial? Because uh, he's getting impeached and Republicans are starting to retreat from him. I mean, I think uh, that's the case. I, I mean, um, in Wisconsin, I don't know. Wisconsin, Ben Wickler says that there's still a big pool for him, a reserve for him to draw on. Really? Well, I mean, the journalist, uh, Matt Jones, who was the guest on Trillbillies, thinks so. And he's a pretty smart guy. I don't know. I can't prove it myself. But um, I think Tom is correct in saying if Bernie were to engage the people who haven't voted All before. Right. Let's uh, let's we'll let's save this. I got to do some ads. Yeah. I, I mean, yes, it's possible that Bernie uh, will have more appeal than than Matt Bashar, you know, in, in Kentucky. Like it, it just seems like it bodes well for a coalition of uh, young people and old people for whom the New Deal is still a thing in their minds. I mean, it's possible. I, you know, we don't we haven't seen the numbers. I mean, all that we know is that there was a lot more um, uh, people who came out in this election than normal in Kentucky. We don't know the specific numbers quite yet. Uh, and we don't know this in Virginia and across the board. And let's wait until, you know, we make 
proclamations until we have more information. I mean, I would like to think so. I would like to think everything you're saying is true. It's just that like there's not really a substantial basis other than Matt Jones's um, uh, perception. It, it seems possible. Also, just for the record, Tom says he doesn't know anybody in Eastern Kentucky who's ever participated in a Gallup poll. There you go. Um, I also have never met anybody who's participated in a poll. And they seem to sometimes work. My mom has, uh, and she always tells me about them, and she's a type of person that will stay on the line for them with them as long as they want. There you she go. she thinks that's democracy. <laughs> hey, folks, one of today's sponsors is BetterHelp. It was giving our audience 10% off their first month when you go to betterhelp.com slash majority report. BetterHelp gives you access to your own fully licensed and accredited therapist via phone, chat, or video. When you sign up, they match you with a therapist based on your specific needs, and you'll be communicating with that therapist in less than 24 hours. If you're not happy with your therapist, you can switch to a new one at any time. You can do it, and you can do it for any reason with absolutely no additional charge. They have 3,000 licensed therapists from all over the country, so they got therapists with specialties that may not be available in your area, particularly rural areas, small towns, small cities. You don't have to drive to an office. You don't have to sit around in a waiting room. You can do everything from the comfort of your own home. BetterHelp also tends to be more affordable than traditional in-person therapy, and they have financial aid options if you qualify. They're giving everyone in our audience 10% off your first month when you go to betterhelp.com slash majority. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash majority report. Also, I we've been uh, advertising for these guys for a long time, actually, now. And uh, just about every set of sheets uh, it, that, that I own and not everyone that my ex-wife owns, we have a weird living arrangement with the kids. I'm not going to get into that. But the point is, is that um, we have as much Brooklyn in as possible because these sheets are fantastic. Holiday time is coming up. Maybe it's time to gift the ones you love or even yourself because you should love yourself. Something a little cozier. Lucky for you, Brooklinen is delivering comfort all season long. Home of the internet's favorite sheets, Brooklinen has over 50,000 five-star reviews and counting. Like I say, I have Brooklinen sheets. I have Brooklinen duvets. I have uh, Brooklyn in towels now. I'm anticipating uh, my Brooklyn in uh, pillows coming in. I'm doing the whole thing now. Like I, I have 40 different types of pillows and like one I like. And so now I'm just going all in and I'm just going to get some uh, all, all Brooklyn in pillows. I, I, I need to let go of some of this stuff in the past and just get, go for what I like. Brooklyn and offers luxury sheets, robes, loungewear, and more without the luxury markups. They're even moved beyond the bedroom to offer essentials for your bathroom, like towels, shower curtains, bath mats. Do you like softness, comfort, essentials to help you relax? Brooklinen has it all. I can't recommend their products more. I don't care if you're a graduate or newlywed, friends, family, acquaintances, business uh, colleagues, employees, you get a gift for your boss. Maybe your boss is getting new uh, Brooklyn and pillows. Maybe maybe you get him a couple of matching uh, um, pillowcases. Get 10% off and free shipping anytime you shop at brooklinen.com. Use the promo code MAJORITY. Brooklinen is so confident in their product that all their sheets, comforters, and towels come with a lifetime warranty. To get 10% off and free shipping, go to brooklinen.com. That's brooklinen, B-R-O-O-K-L-I-N-E-N. Dot com. Use the promo code MAJORITY. Brooklinen, everything you need to live your most comfortable life. Lastly, I don't know if you have a dog that you don't know much about. Most people don't really know. I mean, I guess if you go and you get it from a breeder, but then even then you don't even know if the breeder's been legit. You have a rescue dog, you wonder about what breed it is. It may be fun to have a magical mystery pup. Uh, project onto it what its uh, breed is. But when you find out what its breed mix is, 
you can provide it a better quality of life. The Embark dog DNA test is the best in class dog DNA test. We've got, not only did uh, Kelly give me a testimonial about Embark, this is what she said. She, you, uh, you remember Kelly talking about her dog, Edie. So she got uh, Edie's results from Embark. There's so much information about her. She tested clear for all 171 genetic health conditions. They screen for it. She's not a carrier or at risk for any of all of the genetic diseases they test. There's also a full clinical trait report. So much great news, but more importantly, I can provide the report to her vet, which will provide so much information to help Edie's health as she grows up. You find out what, what what's the best food to feed the dog. You find out are there potential um, disease risks associated with the breed. We got an email. I'm not. I can't read the whole thing right now, and I've read it in the past. But um, uh, it's a listener, his uh, younger brother, and he says best uh, mate is 19 years old. He was diagnosed with Asperger when he was five, and he struggled for many years until they got him a dog named Gregor Samsa. That's, uh, I knew Matt would get a kick out of that. Uh, that is the uh, protagonist from the, uh, the Metamorphosis. And um, the dog has been invaluable to uh, Jacob's um, uh, development over the past almost decade now. And they, um, with Embark, it, they used Embark. They got a DNA test. They are now feeding the dog, uh, you know, differently. They are watching out for different diseases, and it is um, so. Uh, it, it, it's given them such an incredible peace of mind. I mean, it, it's you know, sometimes we do ads and we get responses. This was really, really impressive. Bark's test is is worth it. It's the most comprehensive on the market, developed by doctors and veterinarians. It tests for over 250 breeds and 170 genetic conditions. Competitors can get down to a 12% of a breed mix and barks can get down to accurate to a 5% breed component in a mixed breed dog's ancestry. Um, and bark has an exclusive listener uh, uh, offer for our listeners. You can go to embarkvet.com, embarkvet.com, use the promo code majority, save 15% off your dog DNA test. That's embarkvet.com with promo code majority. Check it out, ladies and gentlemen. Um, all right, let's get back into uh, what happened last night around the country. As you know, uh, Donald Trump loses in, or I should say, Matt Bevin loses in Kentucky. Now, and, and at one point, look, Trump went to Mississippi too, I think it was, right? And uh, in Mississippi, the race was a lot closer than one would anticipate for a governor's race there. I think the uh, Democrat lost by about nine points. But when he was in Mississippi, he made the point of saying, um, what am I doing in Mississippi? And it's true. Like, they don't send the president in unless it's important to them. I mean, I hope people understand this. When Donald Trump goes to Kentucky, a state he won by 30 points, he's not doing this for himself. He doesn't need to go to Kentucky. He needs to go to Wisconsin or he needs to go to Michigan or he needs to go to Pennsylvania or he needs to go to Arizona or Florida. He goes to Kentucky. He's going for Matt Bevin. When he goes to Mississippi, he's going for the Republican governor of Mississippi. And he lost last night. Here's Matt Bevin. Um, basically warning people and this is to to uh jamie's point that just as impeachment failed so too does matt bevins trying to associate andy Bashir with the coming red scourge hi this is kentucky governor matt bevin today sunday bernie sanders crazy bernie is going to be here in kentucky He's here protesting business. He's protesting those who create jobs and opportunity. He thinks that everything should be free. Somehow the job creators should be punished and the people who do or don't work to varying degrees should get everything for free. It doesn't work that way. Anytime someone gets something for free, someone else is paying for it. In this race in 2019 here in Kentucky, 
You also have people on both sides of this equation. Andy Bashir, who's in line with Bernie Sanders, they share the same party, the same ideology. They share the same values on many fronts. They're both strongly pro-abortion. They both strongly believe your Second Amendment rights should be restricted. They strongly believe that you are people who should be punished if somehow you're out there uh, pursuing the American dream. These are the kind of things that we want to reject here in Kentucky. Not only with Crazy Bernie, but with Andy Bashir this fall in November. This is an opportunity for you to choose, not only in 2019, but again in 2020. The American dream is a real thing. Of and by and for the people really works if we the people take it seriously. Exercise your right to vote. Get out there and let your voice be heard. Now, I think he's referencing when he says that Crazy Bernie is coming to town. I think he's talking about the Black Jewel miners. Because I think at one point he came in to show some solidarity with them. And How crazy. And Bashir was promoting aspects, my understanding, of, of the Green New Deal. I don't think he was, you know, I don't think he was having rallies with uh, AOC. But he was promoting aspects of this. And Bashir did quite well, relatively speaking, in parts of coal country there. So, um, you know, I, it's definitely a good sign. I don't know uh, what it means directly, and I don't think that uh, if Bernie Sanders is the nominee, that Kentucky is going to go blue. But it's quite conceivable that there are areas where they're going to have to put more resources in than they would otherwise. I mean, just this is the example. When Donald Trump goes to Mississippi, when Donald Trump goes to Kentucky, deep red states that he won by tens of percentage points he's he is expending resources that could be deployed somewhere else and in this instance they were completely wasted resources every time donald trump goes and campaigns for somebody and they lose it sends a message to other republicans like wait a second maybe he can't help me now, the question is for them is maybe he can still hurt me, though. And that is what's uh, going to make uh, the impeachment inquiry so difficult for Republicans. They are jammed. And it's quite clear. Here's here's Donald Trump in Kentucky. Is this where he's talking about uh, uh, this is where he's talking about the, the impeachment. Right. Here it is. He brings up. I mean, they put everybody behind them in a read the transcript T-shirt. Okay, this is about impeachment for him. Play it. And what's happened to so many other places run by the radical left Democrats, it's unbelievable. Los Angeles. You take a look at Los Angeles. Looks like a third world city. But go back to Nancy's area. Look at what's happened. There's been no place in the country that's gone down like the area that Nancy Pelosi represents and she's wasting all of her time and you know what it's backfiring you see it but the media and the Democrats have launched an even more brazen assault on our nation with a deranged hyperpartisan impeachment with hunt impeachment Think of it. there it is impeachment witch hunt um, read the transcript it says every t-shirt that they have behind Donald Trump and uh so impeachment fails to motivate the Republican base enough in uh, Kentucky. Trump fails to motivate the Republican base. Now, maybe he can bring them out for him. But six months ago, would anybody say maybe Republican voters in Kentucky will come out for Donald Trump? The guy won by 30 points, 30 points. Well, it seems, if anything, it's demotivating people, right? Like you just cited a poll the other day saying that Trump is losing the support of Republicans, which I never expected to happen. I, I mean, it is it's it's starting to erode, uh, erode some of their enthusiasm. We will see. And I would be very, very surprised if any first time voters came out and they were like, you know what? I think I'm going to vote for Trump now not in 2016 i you know i 
tend to think that too. I thought there, but there's so many of those people out there who it's just a question of who I think are motivated, who are angry and we can, uh, you know, uh, people can, can theorize and, and make assessments as to why they're angry um, and uh, why their rage towards uh, people who don't look like them uh, is uh, misplaced. But I think that there's still a lot of people out there. And I think to a certain extent, part of it is, can he reach them and convince them that he is, he is going to, in some way, further their agenda? We will get to this because we still have, well, here, here, we'll get to the, well, let's get to this now. This is a, uh, some Pennsylvania voters in swing districts speaking out about impeachment. Now, before we get to that clip, we'll get to that in a minute. I want to talk about what happened in Pennsylvania last night, and maybe we'll get um, uh, Mike from PA will call in, hopefully. There was a bunch of stuff that happened. The uh, Democrats now will hold all five seats on the Delaware County Council. This has been, according to the uh, Inky, they call it, uh, a Republican stronghold since the Civil War. Now, Republicans in the Civil War were actually pretty good. Uh, they were very progressive. In fact, a lot of the things that we perceive today as being sort of like, you know, parts of modern society, public school, was a function of these Republicans uh, in uh, during Reconstruction. Uh, so that's a... Uh, there's a long realignment A lot of people there. don't know that. Yep. Uh, in Bucks County, Democrats also held a late lead for control of the Board of Commissioners in a close race. And in Philadelphia, this is really interesting. The Intercept wrote about this a couple of days ago. It gets a little bit uh, weedy, but uh, it's, it's, it's really, it's relevant. In Philadelphia, they have district-specific city council seats and then they have i think like a half a dozen at large seats that's a fairly common uh, feature i think in uh, municipal elections they have this thing where if you are part of the party and they don't all of them don't come up at the same time i think they rotate if you are a member of the uh, minority party or a minority party in the district. So I think it could be just based on registration or it could be a number of seats. I'm not 100% sure about that. Uh, they reserve two seats for you on the at large. And it has been traditionally the Republicans. Democrats get the other uh, at large seats and Republicans get two at large seats. The two top Republican candidates in the minority party will get it. Now, it doesn't say Republicans, it says minority party. Well, the WFP is also a minority party in Philadelphia. And they ran two candidates this year uh, that were opposed by Republicans. I mean, excuse me, by, by Democrats. Because the Democrats supposedly were worried that they were going to eat away at their at-large uh, votes for the other uh, Democrats. Now, most observers say that's ridiculous. There's so many Democrats, that's not going to happen. They're not going to be able to peel these votes off. And But what happened is one of them got endorsed by uh, Elizabeth Warren. Bernie Sanders did not endorse either one of them. Uh, Warren only endorsed one of them. A couple of Democrats endorsed one of them. From the WFP, and this is and Larry Krasner endorsed um, one of them as well. Brooks was her name. There were two people who ran, Kendra Brooks and Nicholas O'Rourke. O'Rourke barely lost, but Brooks, Kendra Brooks ran, won. Now, I think the Democrats there did not want a left flank on the city council. I suspect Bernie didn't endorse... Um, these folks, because maybe in part of the WFP national endorsement, maybe in part because he is running in a Democratic uh, primary and needs the support of some of the infrastructure of the Democratic Party and was doing them a solid. 
Regardless, the this pushes the Philadelphia City Council to the left. And this is a big deal. Um, you need a lot of votes in Philadelphia to take uh, Pennsylvania as a state, both, you know, in a presidential election and statewide elections. And uh, this is good. This is the way things get um, moved to the left across that entire state. Also, in Virginia, I think most people know this story, but for the first time in 26 years, Democrats took full control of the state government. They have the House, they have the Senate, and they have the governorship. The GOP had a 20 to 19 majority in the state Senate and a 51 to 48 in the House of Delegates. It is now 21 to 18 in the Senate, Democrats to Republicans, and in the House of Delegates, 54 to 44 Republicans with two that have not been called yet. So Democrats flipped five seats at least in the House of Delegates, two in the state Senate. That's a big deal. People have been anticipating this, but it's a big deal because not the least of which restrictions on Medicaid that were imposed by the Republican House and Senate there will be lifted. Not the least of which because Democrats will control the redistricting in a purple state. And that makes a big difference in terms of the uh, House delegations. And um, uh, folks like Lee Carter and Danica Rome, who won in the 2017 elections, um, Lee Carter, full on. DSA member, but a full on more more socially socialist than even the DSA. Uh and Well, uh, we have everything. And Denica Rome, um, the first transgender woman to win a reelection to a statewide seat uh in the country, I think. Um she ran a great campaign. They I mean obviously they both did, uh, but their reelection is uh a big deal. A really big deal. Because you can get these one-offs. The real question is, how durable is it? And once again, it puts the lie to the idea perpetuated by some that in order to win in a swing state or a swing district, you have to be in the middle. That's right. Well, I mean, I think we got a lot of evidence in 2018 uh, that those people who tried to do that, I I mean, I, I frankly think that at the end of the day, a lot of this is more partisan than it is ideological. And so. Yeah, that's part of why. Yeah. And I think that's a. Uh, uh, and, and, and we're starting to see this happen. I think the, the, that awareness, I think, is, is catching on on a national level. We'll talk about this later. But uh, there was a new poll that came out today. Monmouth uh, survey, I think, that. Um, shows uh, that, A, the new national Monmouth poll shows that Sanders is now essentially back in uh, the race. Biden and Warren at 23%, Sanders at 20%. Warren is down five in that poll. Sanders is up uh, five in that poll. This was just, I think, my sense was when you started to see the uh, establishment start to attack Warren because they thought that she was the biggest threat on the left. And this is also uh, relevant. Uh, The electability quotient that they've developed, the Monmouth, the Democratic electability rating, this is the likelihood of defeating Trump on a scale of 0 to 10. This is Democratic voters nationwide, their perception of someone's electability. Sanders has gone up. Biden's at 7.3. He's always been up there. It's dropped. Warren's at 7.1. Sanders is at 7.0. So for all intents and purposes, you have three front leaders who are 
who are basically tied in the national polls. You know, this is just one poll, but um, there, this has sort of been the trends. You have them equally distributed, maybe Bernie in the first couple of uh, primaries. First, you know, if you look four or five uh, is in the lead in, in, in two or three. Warren in one or two. Biden in one. They are more or less tied, but I think there is broad consensus, at least amongst you know those who are watching this intensely, that Biden is bleeding, is leaking oil, continuing, that Warren's surge is not necessarily as durable as it looked, and that Bernie is creeping up. And in creeping up, he's not, he's not surging, he's creeping, but you have to remember, they all have different strategies that they are, they are, they at least are ascribed to them. Biden's is I'm going to hide (laughs) and hope that, uh, my name recognition carries me across the finish line. Uh, Warren is that I'm going to run on a, uh, technocratic, um, competency and a uh, a more palatable version of fighting palatable i put in quotes bernie's um strategy has been one that is and i i i have no way of knowing and nobody really does strategy has been we're going to build a different type of ground game that's going to reach different people and is going to be subterranean in many respects so we won't know until we get to Iowa as to, you know, what is resonating. You know, particularly when one person's running with, with a strategy that's a little more subterranean, it's hard to assess. The proof will be in the pudding. All right, let me just get to uh, the big impeachment news before we go to the fun half. Because um, and then we'll we'll do a little bit more on uh, the election. There's a couple of like uh, tidbits from around the country that are relevant. Uh, Cause Seamus Want in um, uh, Seattle, it doesn't look great, but the mail-in votes tend to be uh, more uh, progressive than uh, election day votes. She's down by I think about I don't know six seven points. Uh, Amazon spent a million dollars. 1.5. That's that, that, that we see, right? right? That is like explicit, um, to make sure that she didn't get reelected, but we will see if they prevailed, uh, within, um, it'll take us a little time. The council was considering a tax that would have cost Amazon $10 million a year. There you go. So mathematics folks. There you go. And it's not, you know what? Like, look. It's, it's also not, the principle of the thing. It's the the principle and the precedent. Because I don't think they're worried about $10 million. Like, with all due respect, right. um, what's his face? Jeff Bezos? That's the stuff that falls out of his pocket when he takes a dump. Uh, you know, like, oh, where did, where did that million dollar bill go? Eh, whatever. I'm not going to, I'm not going to. It's the same reason the Koch brothers fight public transportation every single place. You need yeah. to do it because you do. You want to set the precedent that if you mess with us, you will lose. So whether that's in New York or what, I mean, that 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 is the issue. It's the precedent. I still, um, I would interview Shannon Moore from Alaska multiple times, and she told me the story of Pebble Mine. And she once confronted the lawyers there. Like, why are you guys fighting this? This is like, it doesn't have that much value to you. And it's the, it's literally the biggest resource of fresh fish that we have in this country that could be damaged. And they're like, we don't care about Pebble Mine, but we just can't lose this one because it means we're going to lose a bunch of others. And so that people have to keep that in mind. Um, They're making, that's the Fonzie rule, Right. Yeah, I mean, why did companies buy workers off in the 1970s every time they struck for more control over production and over their lives? It might not necessarily have cost them anything up front. It set a bad precedent. Exactly. They don't want to show that workers have the power to withhold their labor. 
All right. So let's move to impeachment. This is um, this is pretty stunning. You don't see this very often. So Gordon Sondland, he goes in front of the House Intelligence Committee. He gives a private deposition. Well, this is about three weeks ago, right? Gordon Sondland, again, I'll remind you, the hotelier who gave a million dollars to Donald Trump's inauguration committee was named ambassador to the EU, then was basically given a sort of ex officio, you're ambassador to Ukraine, you're going to run the shadow group that is going to be running a shadow foreign policy with them. He is the one who was on the uh, text chain with Bill Taylor, and we haven't seen Bill Taylor's deposition. Bill Taylor was the outsider, the career diplomat who was brought in. And he was like the Serpico in this uh, sort of cabal, if you will. He was the, the, the cop who was like, wait, what? And... Bill Taylor is going to, they just announced next Wednesday, a week from today, will be the first public hearing. I'm surprised by that. Maybe they felt that we're just going to go for the, we're going to go for the, the, the slam dunk. And they're going to have George Kent, who's the deputy secretary of state of, uh, 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 he's from the state department. We'll get into that in a minute. So Sunlin in his original testimony, gave a lot of like, I don't recalls. And no, it wasn't a quid pro quo. Look, when we say quid pro quo, what we're saying is bribery. Or in this case, extortion, which is like just a variant of a bribe. It is, extortion is, I will withhold or keep something from you that is already due you unless you give me something that I want. Bribery is, Give me something that I want and I'll give you something that you want. It's, it, you know, it, extortion is to bribery as like a, uh, a shepherd, uh, uh, you know, a German shepherd is to dogs. It's like bribery with more leverage. Yeah, it's just, a, it's just a form of bribery. And that's relevant because bribery is one of those things explicitly listed as a reason for impeachment in the Constitution. So... Sunland gave this testimony and then they announced we're going to release the testimony tomorrow. And he had his lawyers draft up a new statement. Because initially Sunland had been squirrely in denying that he was implementing this direct quid pro quo. Here's his new statement. Also, I, I now do recall a conversation on September 1 of 2019 in Warsaw with the uh, presidential aide, the Ukrainian Yermak. And uh, this brief pull aside conversation followed a larger meeting involving the vice president Pence and President Zelensky, in which Zelensky had raised the issue of suspension of U.S. aid to Ukraine directly with Vice President Pence. After that large meeting, I now recall sometimes you, these things are foggy. Speaking individually with Mr. Yermak, where I said that resumption of U.S. aid would likely not occur until Ukraine provided the public anti-corruption statement that we had been discussing for many weeks. Now, I want to remind you folks of something. And this was clear a couple of weeks ago. Donald Trump can say that he was worried about corruption all he wants. The only ask they had was not an actual investigation. It was a claim of an investigation. We don't need to see the investigation. We need you to claim that there is an investigation. You can do whatever you want. But we want to pretend that Joe Biden and Hunter Biden did something wrong here. So we need you to claim there's an investigation. We also need you to claim there's an investigation in 2016 because we want to refute the findings that Russia interfered in the election. This is why they have George P. Kent testifying from the State Department. Because when the CIA and other agencies that came out with the declarative statement that Russia interfered in the 2016 election that ended up in the Mueller report, 
The guy in charge of the CIA was Mike Pompeo. Who now at the State Department is essentially opening the door for Bill Barr and Donald Trump and Rudy Giuliani to create a fiction about Ukrainian involvement in the 2016 election and their attempts to frame the Russians. And that is why he allowed all the disinformation campaign on the then former ambassador to Ukraine to get her out of the way so that Rudy Giuliani and his drug deal cabal, as John Bolton would say, could go in and do what they were doing. So Sunland now has backed off. He also said, I also recall some question as to whether the public statement could come in the newly appointed Ukrainian prosecutor general rather than from the president directly. Soon thereafter, I came to understand, in fact, that the public statement would need to come directly from the president himself. I believe that that information may have come from Giuliani or Ambassador Volker, who may have discussed it with Giuliani. In other words, Giuliani is running the policy. Rudy Giuliani does not work for the U.S. government. Volker's um, testimony was also uh, released yesterday. But here is what uh, Sunland testified back in the day where he went up to the line of saying it was a quid pro quo. Now he's crossed that line. And a reminder, Sunland is not a deep state apparatchnik. He is a hotelier who is a um, good friend of Donald Trump's until yesterday. Sunland had testified originally that Trump and Giuliani's positions, quote, kept getting more insidious. Evolving from a general interest in fighting corruption to an interest in Burisma and finally to an investigation of the Bidens. He noted he was not a lawyer, but he said, quote, he assumed that an effort to pressure Ukraine to do so as pursued by Giuliani with Trump's support would be illegal. Um, that's also problematic because Sunland then knew that what he was doing was wrong. And he knew that what they were doing was wrong. So this is um, a real problem. And all you're going to hear now is like they're going to agree that there was a quid pro quo because they have no other argument. They're going to say that's not that big of a deal. And then they're going to try. They're going to bring Jeff Jordan or Mark Meadows or one of these other idiots onto the intelligence committee. And they're going to try and make it about uh, the Bidens. And if they want to do that, I would say. Okay, because at the end of the day, and nothing we saw yesterday um, changes my mind about this. In fact, it reinforces it. The only thing, ultimately, that's going to matter about impeachment is a half a dozen Senate races, maybe seven, maybe more, and maybe... I don't know, a half a dozen or a dozen uh, house races. And in the vast majority of those cases, it's going to be a massive liability for anybody who voted to protect Trump. Because this is not about, impeachment is not about convincing Republicans. And that may happen. There may be some who are just like, he's impeached. Uh, that's gross. I'm not going to do that. But it also may inspire some people to come out and defend him. We have clips of this. But what it's going to do is it's going to make purple state Republicans who don't want to be tied to Donald Trump. They don't want him, his arm around their waist as they go around and campaign. They've got to make a decision to vote. And if they vote for his impeachment, they're going to lose 20 percent of their base. And if they vote against impeachment. They're going to be tied with Donald Trump. They're going to be little Trumps, mini Trumps. That's a real problem for them. Yeah, with worse delivery of nicknames. And it doesn't matter if Joe Biden, if Mark Meadows gets on there and holds up a, a you know, a, a machine gun with Joe Biden's fingerprints on it. And he was the one who took out, you know, whatever, 
uh, half the cabinet of uh, Ukraine so that Hunter Biden could steal the country's goal. It doesn't. And, you know, whatever fiction they're going to create here, it's irrelevant to how those senators vote because they can't say I voted to protect Donald Trump because Hunter Biden's crooked. That's just not going to work. Particularly if Joe Biden's not the nominee. And that's the name of the game here. Everything else is either gravy or window dressing. Those senators are the one who are really scared by all this. Because when Bill Taylor gets out there and says this, and there is no witnesses to refute what he's saying, um, Donald Trump's got some problems. And I have a feeling that could just be the beginning. All right, we're going to take a big, uh, quick break, head into the fun half of the program. We're going to take your phone calls. We're going to play some clips. We've got, um, I, I don't know what's going on with Steve Ducey, but I feel like we're watching him turn in real time, all of them. Um, and something that's just going to, I think, like leave your mouth agape, some uh, swing district Trump supporters who are just, they can't quit him, folks. They cannot quit him. They will not quit him. It's simply not going to happen. Also, we got more updates on other uh, election news and more. Hopefully, we'll get um, some calls from people on the ground and maybe in Kentucky and in Pennsylvania, get a sense of what's happened there. Um, Just a reminder, it is your support that makes this show possible. When you join the Majority Report, You support the free show. You support other people who frankly don't have the means. Sometimes they're students. Sometimes they've lost a job. Sometimes they're caring for a parent. Um, Our members basically carry, and they're not huge cost to to carry the the bandwidth and whatnot that's involved in this, but they exist. Uh, Our members do that. And uh, you also get the show without commercials. You get the extended show um, and hopefully more and more as we go on. So it's jointhemajorityreport.com. Don't forget amquickie, amquickie.com. Sign up for that. Big help to us. Much appreciated. Just coffee.coop, fair trade coffee, tea or chocolate. Use the coupon code majority, get 10% off. Follow us on Instagram and on Facebook. That also helps. And lastly, as I said earlier, knowing your, bre- your dog breeds mix can help you provide a better quality of life for your dog, for your best friend. And the Embark Dog DNA Test is the best-in-class dog DNA test. It's developed by doctors and veterinarians, tests for over 250 breeds, over 170 genetic health conditions. It's the only research-grade dog DNA test on the market. You can save 15% on a dog DNA test right now. Go to EmbarkVet.com. Use the promo code majority, embarkvet.com. Use the promo code majority. As always, we'll put links into the um, uh, podcast description, YouTube description. Uh, last night uh, was Tuesday. Uh, Crystal Ball was on uh, TMBS. Uh, no, Abby Martin. Abby Martin. Uh, oh, sorry, on that her was the week Gaza before. documentary. And uh, Adolf Reed, big long interview with him. And uh, Nando Vila was in the post game. Um, I'll just do my plug right away because more importantly than uh, TMBS, Literary Hangover, go subscribe Boom. to that. I uh, did a Salem Witch Trials episode. i uh, going to do The Crucible in a little bit. And also Afra Ben, uh, who is, you guys heard of her? She was uh, an early example of a spy who then wrote literature in the in the restoration period of uh, England. Wow. And she wrote uh, uh, one play about uh, Suriname, a uh, Call, it was called Orinoco or the Royal Slave about a slave who was also had royal lineage. So, you know, it was like kind of like anti-slavery, a, but like pro-monarchy sort of thing, which was, just, you know. It's either or, I think, a lot of times. Yeah. It's a woke monarchy. But she was like, a, and she was one of the er- first Tories. So she's mixed politically, but she is uh, definitely a sort of feminist, uh, early feminist. The first uh, professional playwright, I think you could say, as a woman in England. So we're going to be talking about her. In so she was a member of the professional managerial class. Exactly. She was a PMC. <laughs> and very strong PMC <laughs> energy from uh, after Ben. So. Uh, Jamie. This week on the Antifada. Sean KB is joined by fellow building tradesmen, Billy and John, to do a little workers inquiry on themselves. 
They discuss their own work histories and how they became radicalized through historical events and their experiences on the job. They poke holes in the J.D. Vance white working class mythos that sees cultural regression as the wellspring of Trumpism. And lastly, they talk about the structures they've encountered in their particular unions and how the working class might overcome the provincialism and conservatism of business unionism. It's a scorcher, folks. Check it out. All right, folks. See you in the fun half. You right. are in for it. All right, folks. 646-257-3920. See you in the fun half. Alpha males are back, 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 boy, back, and the alpha males are back, back, just as delicious as you can imagine. The alpha males are back, 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 boy, back, and the alpha males are back, 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 back. Just wanna degrade the white man. Alpha males are back, back. I take all of it to my throat. Alpha males are back. Almost says what? The alpha males are back, 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 back. You are a madman! And the alpha males are back, back, back. I, I, I am a total cunt. Can we bring back DJ Danner song, please? Yeah, or a couple of them. Just put them in rotation. DJ Danner. Well, the problem with those is they're like 45 seconds long, so I don't know if they're enough of a break. That's fucking nonsense. Hey, folks, fucking reminder. I do not have Parkinson's. And the alpha males are psych. Fuck them. Fuck them. Fuck em. Fuck em. Uh, 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 says what? 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 Have you tried doing an impression on a college campus? I, I think that there's no reason why reasonable people across the divide can't all agree with this. Psych. And the alpha males are back, 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 back. And the Africans are black, 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 black African. And the alpha males are back, 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 back. And the Africans are black, 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 black. Donald Trump out there, doesn't a little part of you think that America deserves to be taken over by jihadists? Keep it at 100. You can't knock the hustle. Come on! Fuck them! Fuck them! Fuck them! Fuck them! Fuck em, fuck em. Things I do for the bigger game plan. By the way, it's my birthday! It's my birthday! Happy birthday to me, Jew boy! I have a thought experiment for you. And the alpha males are back, back. Africans are black, black. Alpha males are back, back. Africans are black. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, it is the famous fun half of the program. Uh, perhaps even more famous than the first half of the program. Not exactly sure how that works. Not exactly sure how that's possible, but it, it feels like it is. Where the heck? I don't know. When I started listening to this show way back when, I I was an interview listener and didn't really discover the fun half until uh, like a few months into the show. Dude, when you, uh, at that time, you would read 150 books a year and you showed up oh. in a- I was unemployed. Uh, uh, in a in a in a suit vest and a tie. It wasn't a vest. It was a wool, a gray wool suit. <laughs> the only one that. But I did got. you have a three? It was, but it was a three. It was a three piece suit. I just had a nice shirt on underneath. No, it. you had a vest. I on. definitely didn't. You did. I. Okay. I remember it specifically because I was like, "That's funny." Hired. False. Okay, sure. Hired. Oh my God. This guy's gonna show up in a three piece suit in here. Hired. Boom. Well, I showed up on a bike because Sean thought that that would impress you. I, I, I mean, I was impressed by that. I did like that. 
I was like, oh, should I ride my bike? I don't want to get all sweaty before I get there. And Sean's like, no, babe, liberals love bikes. It's true. There you go. I was totally pro bike. Uh, let's go to the phones. Call from a 610 area code. You like Batman. You like Batman. I put out a call. And there you are. 610? Wow. Hey, Sam, it's Mike. Mike from PA. I knew it was you. I knew it was you. Yeah, well, you know, when you called out, about 30 people messaged me to call you. So There you go. You know. it's, like, it's like the bat signal. <laughs> so That's Pennsylvania, right. I mean, That's I've right. gone over some of it, but, um, but, but put, it, you know, put it in context for us. What does it mean in Delaware County? What does it mean in uh, Bucks County? Uh, what's it mean with what happened in Philadelphia with uh, one of those WFP um, members? And we should say the WFP in Pennsylvania is not a fusion party. It's an actual party. Yeah, it's, a, it's an actual different party because we don't have fusion voting in Pennsylvania. Um, I would say that, you know, the Chester, Bucks, Delaware stuff is very important. But the other thing I would mention, it wasn't just a win for Democrats in Pennsylvania. It was a lot of anti-establishment Democrats as well. If you go up the whole east side of Pennsylvania, all the way from Philadelphia to the Poconos, you know, up in Scranton, I believe they had a independent Bernie Krat defeated the Democrat for the sit for the mayor's race. Uh, here in the Lehigh Valley, in Allentown, you know, far left progressives won the city council. Uh, the Mark Pinsley. The race I ran last last year, he was running for state senate, the only our revolution endorsed candidate who narrowly lost to a member of the Republican leadership, ousted a two-term Republican incumbent for a county government here, uh, here in Lehigh. Democrats swept all four at-large uh, county council seats in Lehigh County the first time that's ever happened, um, taking, I believe, it is like a 6-2 or I'm sorry, uh, five two majority in the uh, uh, county uh, council. Uh, you go down Chester, Democrats took control for the first time since 1850 something. Uh, <laughs> you know, Bucks, which is where Mindy lives, traditional Republican stalwart, is now firmly in Democratic hands. You go down the line, it's all just um, <laughs> a Republican Party being totally hollowed out and annihilated. Which is, and it's not through just, you know, standard Democrats, but progressive Democrats. And in, in Philadelphia, they hold those two seats to get back to your question for the quote minority party. Well, Democrats win 90% of the vote. Why the hell wouldn't you have a far left, a more left party rather than hold two seats for Republicans, which have no electoral support at all? And what's curious is you would think that would make a lot of logical sense to have more left voices, more progressive voices on the council. And yet the democratic establishment, the machine, no, 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 no. We need to hold the Republican seats open here. And they opposed. Well, I mean, look, let's not be coy party. about this. We understand why that is the case because it's the same reason why there are times where, uh, you know, like, you know, if, if you gave Chuck Schumer, um, 10 more Democrats, but said that they're all, you know, members of the DSA, he would say, uh, we, we don't need to let's let's slow down. Let's just um, let's just keep it as the dynamic that it is, because they when there's when there are people on the on the on the council that are to the left of you, it makes it harder for you to make an argument that we need to sort of like, you know, temper things like you, you lose the fig leaf um, that is provided by having a party that is opposing you from across the ideological spectrum rather than from your yeah. flank. Yeah, and, and I, I think I want to underline why the Democrats and the left-wing Democrats especially are winning. It's because people are turning out. <laughs> it's not because they've persuaded Republicans. Right. In fact, in a lot of areas, Republican, like, absolute vote number went up. Like, Republicans are turning out too, but there's just so many more left-wing people that if they actually engage in politics, like they can't win. And I think last week you had, uh, what was that, Professor Bitkoffer on, and she talked about how actually Blue Dog Democrats depress Democratic turnout by somewhere between 5 and 10%. And bold, progressive Democrats 
and even socialists, as proven by Lee Carter and Bernie Sanders himself. Like, this is not something that we've, we're testing just now. Like, Bernie is the point. Like, Vermont used to be a Republican state. Right. And it was Bernie Sanders' movement that built a progressive wave in, in Vermont and transformed it into the most progressive state in the country. That didn't happen through magic. Bernie was the person who did it. And now he's the most popular senator from his own constituents. Okay, so that, that, that Bernie did it and that it was magic are not necessarily mutually exclusive. Okay, give me your case. I, I'm, I was joking. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no oh, it's hard to tell sometimes because, like, you know, it, it, the evidence doesn't... I magic's mean, it not doesn't real. seem to matter. Mike, magic's yeah, not Yeah, yeah, I know magic's not real. <laughs> <laughs> but it doesn't, it, doesn't seem, it doesn't seem to affect some people. Like, you know, Sherrod Brown in Ohio, you just kind of close your eyes to the fact that he ran as a labor Democrat and he crushed it. Well, the centrist got horribly defeated. All right. Well, that Sherrod Brown state. is like, also, <laughs> Sherrod Brown is also like, he's actually, he does have some wizardry that I've seen him do. Like, yeah, yeah, he can yeah. do alchemy. Warlock. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. 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 But, um, yeah. So, so I mean, all right. So let me ask you this. I don't mean to monologue. No, no, no. All right. Much, let but... me, so let me ask you this. Um, we're looking at, uh, these are, these, these, uh, at least these Senate seats, uh, and these House seats, or the House of Delegates seats, these were redistricted, right? We still have the old congressional seats, though, in Pennsylvania, don't we? No. Uh, the congressional seats got thrown out um, oh, is the before co- last year. Oh, well, then it was the state Senate seats that got... That, that, we that, still that, have the remain. state legislature. Yeah, yeah okay. So why? Have, why? why? I, I, I mean, <laughs> you're, asking, you're asking me questions that I don't have a good answer to. Oh, all right. <laughs> if I were in charge, I would be suing. What do you what, what do you want from me? But I'm I'm curious as to what the there must be a dynamic there. I mean there must be the 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 control the 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 uh, the the people who are pulling the levers in the state in the in the state legislature must be okay. It may it, you know, it sounds like it could be a dynamic that's not too dissimilar from what we saw in the Philadelphia City Council. Um, I do think there might be a, a technical legal argument about it being a case that has already been reviewed. You know, like uh, the failure to bring up the arguments in the past may not may mean that there it doesn't matter. You brought up the case, you had the chance to bring the arguments, and you didn't. So they might be foreclosed just from like technical, boring okay. legal reasons. All right, because um, they did challenge the districts um, and they were upheld when they were originally put in back in 2012. So. Uh, I mean, that might be the reason, uh, you know, I don't want anyone to claim, think I'm claiming to be a lawyer or anything, but. Uh, <laughs> All right. Well, uh, now, um, we know. now you know that you're not a lawyer. Now, let me ask you this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so so what else? So what are the implications of this, do you think, uh, for um, if you if you take those victories in those and we don't know the turnout numbers relative, right? It's too early to get a sense of like just exactly. I mean, anecdotally, people are saying in like Virginia that uh, turnout was super high, that I think like the, the, the Kentucky race turnout was super high. Um, but we don't really know yet, do we? Do, we don't have like an apples to apples uh, comparison. It, it, or do it we? usually takes a month for a, a number and people will look at the fresh number and compare it to the official number and go, oh, it's not higher than that. But typically we're going to, I think turnout's higher. I mean, I, I, my, my feeling here on the ground was that turnout was higher than even 2017, it's one, uh, which is the like the odd year, which was high turnout. So it feels like it was pretty damn high to me. And, and Virginia is like just a great case of um, how we can actually make huge changes. And, and Virginia was one of the worst gerrymandered states. And having a democratic trifecta now they can really push a lot of things that will structurally change politics of Virginia forever. Like if they make voting easier, um, all those kind of things that we talk about that will make those long-term permanent changes in turnout. Like I, I think Virginia is pretty much a lost cause for the Republican party for a while. Uh, and similar trends happening in Colorado, and they've adopted the same strategy, you know, Democrats got in control in Colorado and then they did universal vote by mail and it's kind of just zipped off from there. So, 
yeah that's, that's a big deal well um anything else we should know i mean what does this mean what is, like when you see like what happened in bucks county and delaware county what is that if it was you know big turnout what does that suggest to you in terms of because pennsylvania was the biggest i mean most pivotal it was, loss. A turning point. It was the most pivotal loss it yeah. seems to me in the 2016 election yeah. right i mean that's forty thousand votes it's the biggest vote margin that uh clinton lost in terms of like the key electoral states um d- d- when you look at this do you think like oh uh, getting an extra forty thousand votes that's going to be a cakewalk assuming that there is not a candidate who's going to depress that enthusiasm yeah, and, and that's exactly my my biggest fear is that we is we pick someone who depresses enthusiasm among people of color and young people. Um, that's the reason why we're winning is you know college educated people, people of color, and young people are participating in elections they use previously didn't, and a lot of the reasons they are is because of this progressive energy, um, and that's what's really changing the game. You know, the old white Republican wealthy people are voting more than they did before, even in 2010 and stuff. Like, they're just being overawed by the participation of young people. So I would say that if you're a progressive or, or a socialist or anybody like that, you should be leaning in and you should be pushing back hard against anybody saying we should compromise. Because to me, that's the way we, we get electoral defeat, is somebody who just saps everyone's energy, nobody cares, it's not significant, and... And, you know, the Republican base is fully fired up and will be fully fired up. There is no way depressing them. By picking Joe Biden, there's not going to be a bunch of Trump fanatics that are like, oh, well, I guess he's reasonable. They're just going to smear him as a corrupt socialist, just like they would any other Democrat. They have the same playbook and they're going to manufacture the same kind of shit that they do against anyone. But the problem with someone like Joe Biden is there's no corresponding passion. Right. There's no base right. of people that want to die for him. Right. Like there is with the other progressive candidates. Right. I, I so agree. We I, have more people. Well, we that's have the thing. Way more people. 2018, people have to remember that Republican turnout was also record high for them. It yes. just so happens that the Democratic turnout was even more of a record. And and that's the name of the game. It's just the the it is basically which side uh, the the Republicans game plan is, can we depress turnout on the Democratic side? And the Democratic um, uh, game plan is, can we maximize our turnout? Because we have more voters. And, and, and the one thing that Professor Bitcoffer and Jamie as well have been saying a lot was the difference between the Republican and Democratic strategy is blatant. Like the Republicans run a base mobilization strategy every time. They are not shy about saying that we're demonic forces and we need to lift up Jesus or like that kind of, that's what they campaign on. There is no moderate Republican campaign messaging. Um, and it's the Democrats who are ashamed to be Democrats. And those are the people that lose. And we need people that are going to go out there and motivate the base. And the one thing, one data point that Professor Bickhoffer pointed out, which is really important for people to understand is even with this crazy turnout we had in the past, you know, 2018 and to some extent last night, Republicans turned out at a higher rate than Democrats, meaning there are more Democrats still out that have not been engaged let me, in the political let me, process. Let me just, let me who, just who could make, that, right? uh, make that clear so that people can understand, because I yeah, think yeah. that could be just a little bit uh, difficult for people to just conceptualize. Yeah, yeah, sorry. So, in other words, and I don't know the specific numbers, but I'm just going to make up numbers. Um, Republicans came out at record numbers where they had, let's say, this is higher than it is, but uh, 90% of registered Republicans came out. And Democrats Mm -hmm. broke their record in an even bigger way by just having 80% of their registered Democrats come out. Because there are just simply right. more of Demo- registered Democrats than there are of Republicans. So the actual numbers obviously are, are, are different when you're just looking at it in terms of percentages. Which means that there's even more uh, people out there to be motivated on the Democratic side. So if Dem- it, it, it's almost uh, the analogous, the, the, an- the analogy is um, the reason why it's relevant 
that Bernie Sanders average campaign donation is whatever it is this time around, 35 bucks. 18, I think. Or 18, think 18. bucks. Is that yeah. you can go back to those people theoretically up to 2,500 bucks per person or 2,300 bucks per person. And so um, that makes a big difference. Well, let me give you an example that's concrete and not just not just theoretical. In Pennsylvania, there are about one million more registered Democrats than Republicans. I'll say that again. In Pennsylvania, the state that Trump won, there's about a million more Democrats than Republicans. Doesn't mean all those Democrats are dyed in the wool blue, you know, vote blue no matter who. But it does mean that the pool of people that we have is just tremendously larger, which is why it's always baffling that people want to try to pick off moderate Republicans. If anything, just by the numbers, you would think that if the Democrats would be running a base mobilization strategy and the Republicans would be trying to pick off moderate Democrats. It's just really fascinating that that's not the strategy that's pursued in American politics today. And you have to wonder why that is. Right. And that number gets even larger when you look at all the people who are not currently registered Democrats, but whose... Um, I didn't catch Demographics that. Demographics. Yeah, Jamie's saying that that number gets even larger when you contemplate how many people um, would be more likely to register as a Democrat than a Republican. But who aren't who registered are, who are yet. Unregistered, totally. Oh, oh God. And that is a group that's I mean, poorer and less white. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's actually disgusting if you look at it, um, which is like one of the motivations for me personally is, is knowing these, these facts. Um, and trying to get this into the political bloodstream of everyone to like get confident. Like the idea that we're a center right country is just <laughs> blatantly ridiculous um, in every aspect. And we just have to have people that are actually going to stand up and fight. And one of the things that I, I don't know if you noticed is even in that New York Times piece that came out about electability a couple days ago, Bernie Sanders was by far and away the best candidate in Michigan. He was a great candidate in Wisconsin. He was a great candidate in Pennsylvania. And in the 2016 primary, he won Wisconsin. He won Michigan. He got it very close in Pennsylvania. And when he won Michigan in, in, in 2016, it was the largest polling mistake ever in world history. He outperformed the polls by over 20 points. Dang. And, and, and the reason why is because they underestimated the number of independents that would come out to vote, the number of young people that came out to vote, the young, number of poor and working class people that came out to vote. Uh, and so when we see, when we have a candidate that needs to win Michigan, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania, and we see what's working in Pennsylvania, the candidates that are winning, it's baffling to me that we would go the other way, right back into the same playbook that led us to disaster in 2016. The, uh, you know, the, and I don't know the, the polling outfit to do this, and I don't know that there is one, frankly, but what is, what is, what I've been really curious about is, um, because, you know, Joe Biden's biggest talking point is his African-American support in, in, uh, in particularly in the Southern states, but just broadly speaking in the Democratic Party. And, and that's real, and that's hugely important. I My hunch, and this is just a hunch, and that's why I would love to see polling data on this, is that that cohort of African Americans who support Joe Biden, they are stalwart, completely dependable Democratic voters. They're like, you know, yeah. dispositionally, they're like me. I'm going to vote in every election. And I'm going to go and I'm going to vote 99 out of 100 times uh, for the maybe on a national level, 100 out of 100. I don't care who it is. I mean, you know, give me a little wiggle room because I'm in New York and there may be times where, I, you know, certainly I mean, I voted for <laughs> Ralph Nader. But um, but with that said, I think these voters are going to show up to the polls, whomever is the Democratic candidate. I think the support that Sanders gets in the African-American community are people who are less likely than that other cohort that support Biden to definitely show up. That's my hunch. And that type of polling would be very, very helpful because um, reaching one cohort of voters is not necessarily 
as valuable as reaching another because one and and politicians do this all the time. You tell me you've run campaigns. There's certain ones that you can take for granted that they're going to show yeah. up. And you Facebook. take them you 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 take them for granted because um you have limited resources and the question is where do you deploy these resources? Do I deploy them? You know, it's, it's the same reason why Donald Trump it's weird that he's got to go to Kentucky and convince people to vote for the Republican candidate there. Well, yeah, I mean, on my on my Twitch channel, because I have a Twitch partner now, Sam, at Central Committee on Twitch. I, I was wondering how long I'd have to get into this conversation <laughs> until you plug that. Uh, you can hear more. I talk about this exact thing. Like, uh, I mean, I'll, if you want to give me more time, I can rant about this forever. No, but like, you have yeah, a this, Twitch this channel. Practice. You're a Twitch partner. I know. <laughs> Make sure it's linked. Um no, no, all seriousness. The, uh, the, the, um, the thing about the, I'll give you an example of what you're saying. First of all, there's an idea that black voters are a monolith, like, which is just absolutely blatantly racist. I don't know how else to put it. Black voters in, say, South Carolina have a different ideological and voting propensity than black voters in, say, Michigan or Wisconsin. Right. They're different. Right. And there's there is a desire to just say black voters as a monolith and describe it nationally in a way that's totally incoherent. By the way, it's also incoherent to do that with white voters, too. White voters in Pennsylvania are different than white voters in Alabama by quite a significant margin. Oh, yeah. And it also has the, to do with people's age and their job and all sorts of different things. Right. Yeah, I mean, and Jewish not, voters are virtually I mean, the like, only ones you could do that for, because uh, for the most part, we're, the Jewish voters are going to vote for Democrats. I mean, there's 25 percent that won't. But uh, it doesn't matter if I'm a, a Jew living in Boston or I'm living in um, yeah, I'm going to vote for a Democrat unless, you know, like uh, unless I, you know, a gambling mogul. Yeah, and, and of course, but like, for example, Emerson just did a poll of, of Michigan this week. And they went by demographics, and Bernie Sanders had 70% of the 18 to 29-year-old cohort. Um, and if you're a Democratic Party politician, that you know the more young people come out, the more likely you are to win. Whereas Joe Biden's you know, support is people overwhelmingly not 55-plus, but 65-plus. That's his base. So the 65-year-old African-American plus voter, you know, is a Democratic-based voter, for sure. In other words, uh, their but, propensity to vote is like, uh, I don't know, 98%. 80%. And, and you okay, think they 80%. would vote for whoever the nominee is? Yes, they're going to come and vote. Would, yeah. They're, they're going to yeah. come and, and, and vote. And, yeah, and, and when, we're, when we talk about when we're running political campaign, we draw like a quadrant of four types of voters. You have, you know, and the quadrant is based on two factors. The one is propensity to vote, and the other, the other number is your uh, ideological or your partisanship score. And the parties have numbers for every single human being in, in the country. And you will look at your geographic location, and you know all the voters that live there, and you have scores for all of them. And you create, you model previous elections and you make projections about what's going to happen in this election. And then you try to come up with the number that you need to get 50% plus one. And then you look at the voters in these quadrants and the quadrant. So, for example, like a, a high propensity voter who's highly democratic like you, Sam, would be in our base. And you would get almost nothing as far as resources because we know you're showing up. Right. We know you're self-motivated. And we don't need to waste any time on you. So I'm, we just have your numbers. So we figure out that number and we bank it. Right. And then there's two other, then there's the Republican base category, and those are enemy voters. And Let's we not just say try to enemy repress them. voters, just voters we don't agree with. Sure, sure, sure. Voters sure, we sure, agree sure, to sure, sure, or not yeah, agree yeah. with. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Voters we agree to disagree with. Um, and then there are two other categories of voters. And progressives, and this is a far larger number, want to target what's known as a drop-off voter, which is a highly left-leaning voter who doesn't have a great track record of showing up all the time. Jimmy. And then 
centrists or, you know, right wing Democrats, or corporate Democratic machine loves to target what's known as persuadable. Right. So people that have high propensity to vote, but middling scores. And that typically is about like 20 percent the size of the drop off. Well, because voter. the argument has been in the past that it's easier to convince somebody who's definitely going to the polls to vote for your guy instead of the other guy or gal um, versus try and can motivate somebody to get to the polls. But, and, and maybe that was true at one point that it was very difficult to get someone to the polls. Um, but, in part because negative partisanship plays such a big role that it's almost like they're half out the door now when they weren't in the past that you can come in with a, um, with enough enticement to get them fully out the door. Right. I mean, that's the theory well, or, or, I mean, or I, the counter narrative would be that nobody showed up with enough to entice them out the door last time. And that you can actually do. I, I mean, you're you're getting into. Like, I'm feeling nostalgic for all sorts of uh, screaming matches I've had in the past. Uh, but basically, I disagree so much that it's hard to put it to words. Let me just put it this way: you disagree the first with thing, what? the problem with the pers- with the persuadable voter attack model of trying to win. Um, I think it's just so stupid; it's unbelievable that it's actually still a thing. First of all, when you try to persuade someone, first they take way, way more resources to persuade than it does to turn out. That's just a fact. Right. Uh, like, I mean, you're, you're talking about doing like 12 flights of direct personalized mail, television commercials, radio, digital ads, extensive canvassing. And it like that's for a persuadable versus a a, a base voter or drop off voter. You know, you talk to them a few times, you help them get to the polls, you knock on election day to make sure they went, kind of thing. Right. And it's and you train them where their polling place is. You give them confidence that they that you know because a lot of them don't have the habits of voting, so they're not really sure where do I go, how do I do it, am I going to get in trouble? Very basic questions that you can help them hold their hand and then they become a voter for life. It is, it's, and the other problem with the persuadable thing is it's anti-solidarity with other candidates. Because I'll give you an example. I, say I knock on a door and persuade this person to vote for me, but then they tell me they're voting Republican down the ballot for other candidates. What do I do with that? Right. Do I bring them out and possibly fuck over other candidates? And what that does if the answer is what happens is candidates pull apart from each other because they're trying to get to their stupid fucking win number right, and they only care that. about themselves. And, and, and so you have these situations where people want to turn out a voter that's going to vote for them, but it won't. And so you're breaking apart like what should be a unified campaign team or well, it's also it's, just, it's less efficient right because <laughs> if i can't rely on you to drive out my voters and you can't rely on me to drive out your voters then we we've we've got a real efficiency problem but well, nevertheless it's less efficient and, and it's it creates rightward drift because right. the who's voting for a candidate helps determine the things that they do in office and Indeed. who they're responsible to your electorate is now uh not 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 necessarily the one you want that's going to give you the room to do these things which i'm not sure in certain mm-hmm. instances wasn't part of the plan nevertheless uh i don't know if i like this version of mike from pennsylvania that that feels it necessary to swear Oh, sorry, I forgot about the new rules. I uh, I apologize. Uh, please. Well, please it's not even the, the new rules. It's just like I don't, you know, you get on Twitch and all of a sudden now you're just like throwing around the cuss words. Uh, it's my, all 13-year-old like you, plat- gamers. That platform has a lot less dignity than this one. Go ahead, Jamie. Sorry. Oh, I just said it's all the 13-year-old gamers that you interact with on the regs. They got <sighs> some little potty mouths on them. It's true. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. That Mike well, from Pennsylvania I'll, is so cool. He says F. He drops the F bomb all the time. That's why I watch him. Um, Mike, <laughs> thank you for this. Uh, very insightful. Uh, what is the name of your uh, your Twitch uh, handle? In, uh, in honor to the many part, glorious parties in the past, I made myself Central Committee on Twitch.tv. Central Committee. Twitch partner. I am officially part of the capitalist Bezos empire now, unfortunately. Uh, <laughs> Oh, wait, does Amazon own that? 
Amazon, uh, Amazon owns Twitch. You can't avoid these. They bought it. You can't avoid these fucking oligarchs. We need wow, to they own them up. everything. There's but, a lot of uh, rival uh, um, uh, platforms, uh, gaming platforms that we're examining right now. Not for long. You know, I was walking um, around Bushwick the other day and I saw a creepy ad for Twitch. It said, you may already be one of us. There you go. And I was like, don't <laughs> tell me my business, Bezos. Appreciate the call, Mike. <laughs> Thanks, bud. One more thing. Hey, if you if you guys ever want me to come to Brooklyn, I'm just an hour away. Just let me know, and I can I can chill out with you guys someday. All right. So anytime. Appreciate it. Ah. <laughs> That's a good way to end that. <laughs> wow, that was an epic Mike from PA call. Well, I I, I put out the bat signal for uh, Mike from PA. Um, let's. Let's start with the, uh, yeah, the voters. Now, let's start with the voters. Um, Allison Camrata sat down with some of those independent voters in Pennsylvania. You know, independent voters, the ones who are free thinking, the ones who would listen to Shep Smith uh, and Ann Coulter to get both perspectives, but forgot about who Shep Smith was already. And now they're like, we listen to both perspectives, both Hannity and Ann Coulter. They are speaking out on impeachment, right? Because we need to recreate, we need to create the, the, the narrative that impeachment is going to hurt the Democrats. Again, I will tell you, impeachment is only relevant in the context of maybe six or seven senatorial races, and then maybe house races across the, um, uh, the country. But just because they're in swing districts does not mean that they're swing voters. Let's play this. How many people think the impeachment process will hurt President Trump? I think it's going to hurt everyone. Okay, so you think it will hurt President Trump. Is that to say that the other five of you think it will hurt the Democrats? I think it's going to hurt everyone. I think yeah. when you yeah. splash mud, it hits everyone. Yeah. yeah. And again, they're not going to get nothing done because they're doing all this worrying about these hearings and impeachment. To be fair, 490 bills have been passed by the House. 65 pieces of legislation How many are that came in the out Senate? of it. 65. So 65 pieces of legislation. I say because a lot of things are come coming out of the House and then dying in the Senate. Absolutely. Right. Because right. they won't work together. There's literally no compromise. Yeah, anymore. right. But compromise do you guys is not want a thing. Compromise? Yes. yes. No one's supposed yes. to win all the time. Right. Everyone, from a we, business perspective, you well, are compromised. You don't walk away every time. Most of us are mothers, that. and we want everyone to work together. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. You're you know, tired of the divisiveness. We yes. are. Absolutely. We are. That's why we voted for Donald Trump. Are. Yeah. Do you think that President Trump plays any role in that divisiveness? No. 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 Yes. no. Do you think he's being helpful? <laughs> oh, my God. I think he's being helpful, yes. How? How is he so bringing country together? Thank you. They're so right. I'm not sure how he's bringing the Democrats and Republicans together. However, I do think he's trying to get stuff done. Exactly. Let's go around and one word for these past three years, how you would describe the Trump presidency. Go ahead, Allison. Uh, divisive. <laughs> Entertaining. <laughs> and you one, never know what you're going to get every day. <laughs> one long one, one of a kind. One of a kind, definitely. Yeah, that's three I words. believe he's for the people. That's also three ways. So you believe the Trump presidency for the These people are means um, selfless? Mm. No. <laughs> I'm a people. Just for the people. He's, he's making a change. Making a Embarrassing. Great. Oh, that's a good Ooh. one. That is a good one. Fantabulous. <laughs> <laughs> so and so, so, Crystal, is there anything that he could do or anything that could happen that would make you not vote for him? No. If he shot someone on Fifth Avenue, would you vote for him? You'd have to know why he shot him. Yeah, why did he shoot him? There you go, ladies and gentlemen. Wow. How do we get Mindy on one of these panels? Well, here's the question. How do we, how do we, how do we convince these people they should not vote for Donald Trump? That's I don't know, but I think that should be the center point of our electoral strategy. Exactly. That's my point, is that the Democratic Party needs to reach out to these people. Stop being so, like, you know. 
I mean, that, that that's the bottom line. Like, those voters, first of all, they're not swing voters. They're in a swing district. There's not a single swing voter there. Even the one who said that, you know, the, the one who said that uh, Donald Trump was embarrassing. They're not swing voters. They're done. They're cooked. They're irrelevant to this entire operation. We know how they're going to vote. Mm-hmm. Kind of feel like one of those ladies was Mindy's bitch neighbor. Donald Trump, the reason why Donald Trump shot them was because Donald Trump is like, um, is like, uh, uh, McC- uh, what's that guy's name? McLean in Die Hard. And he had to rescue people. And Donald Trump took it upon himself to, to whip out his Glock. What? It was a terrorist. <laughs> you don't want me to shoot a terrorist? What do you like, terrorists? And, and Donald Trump waddled down fifth avenue after this culprit and shot him down with his uh with his amazing aim that's what happened and the military guy said it was the best shot he ever saw i'm sorry i mean if anybody tells me that the american people want compromise and then follows up with donald trump is not divisive and i have no problem with divisive we are a divided country But you cannot hold these two things in your head that you want compromise and Donald Trump is not divisive. Because if that's the case, I mean, this is, you know, uh, we're going to go over the same territory as we've had before. But, you know, I wonder what the change is that he's brought. We don't don't have a black president anymore. So Not embarrassed anymore. Yeah. Got a normal president, not not a woman, not a black guy, just a normal president. It has been entertaining. She was right about that. It has been so entertaining. Um, meanwhile, it's always fun to watch what's going on at Fox and Friends, see how they're dealing with this stuff. The constant push and pull of... How do we stay in Donald Trump's good graces, but also how do we acknowledge some reality? And then sometimes, like, I woke up this morning, I felt like an actual human being, and this leaked out on the show today. I wonder if that's what Steve Ducey was saying to Brian Kilmeade. Brian Kilmeade looks like his dog died uh, in this clip, because, and maybe to a certain extent he did. I always wonder, like, at one point, is one of them going to go like, you know what, I'm going to be the Alan Combs. I don't know if people remember Hannity and Combs. That's how uh, the Hannity show started. Alan Combs, he was a, I mean, a guy with a pedigree not too dissimilar from mine. Uh, I think he was a stand-up at one point, years and years and years ago, and then he became a political uh, commentator on radio. Uh, Nice guy, not, uh, you know, not always the sharpest, uh, um, you know, debater. There was a there was a quality to him that he was, uh, you know, the Washington Wizards. He had a show after he left Hannity and Combs that I thought was a little bit sharper than it was uh, than when he was with Combs. Uh, but he was playing a role and he was on TV. I always wonder, like, when they're going to do that, when one of them is going to just be like sort of the foil. I don't know if that's what's going on here with Steve Ducey, but he is um, he's starting to get a little nervous about this whole thing where there's Candidates who are actually offering stuff to people. After each other, and Jamie Dimon, who is the German CEO. Oh. Sorry. Ashley. Uh... Oh, do we have the? Do we get the wrong? No, we do. But I was just like way too Okay. Try this one more time. Uh, J.P. Morgan Chase. He said this about Elizabeth Warren. You really have to ask her what she really means. She uses some pretty harsh words. Uh, you know, some would say vilifies successful people. So I don't like vilifying anybody. I, you know, I think we should applaud successful people. Yeah, yeah I would that's what now. I, Again, um, two things to note on this. Jamie Dimon, horrible human being, uh, a banker who... Um, one of the people are responsible for a tremendous amount of misery uh, that people have gone through over the past decade. And... Uh, again, there was a sense amongst these people that uh, Bernie Sanders was uh, off the table, and so they should just step on and start moving to attack Elizabeth Warren. Um, 
now I think they're going to have to deal with the reality that uh, Bernie's uh, campaign is um, actually creeping uh, back into the polls. But all right. So here they are. Uh, J.P. Morgan, CEO. Should we we should applaud successful a people. Oh, it's done. If you're successful, right. you shouldn't be vilified for it. You've worked really hard. Right. And so, uh, Ainsley, on top of that, there's a theme with Elizabeth Warren. Attack the big companies, attack the uh, attack powerful CEOs and try to look like you're sticking up for the little man or little woman. Uh, here's what Warren says back. And by the way, this plays right into her, uh, which he thinks is going to help her. It's really simple. Jamie Dimon and his buddies are successful in part because of their opportunities, workforce and public services that we all paid for. It's only fair that he and his billionaire friends chip in to make sure everyone else has a chance to succeed. The fact that they've reacted so strongly, so angrily to being asked to chip in more tells you all about the need to know. This is all you need to know. The system is working great for the wealthy and well-connected, and Jamie Dimon doesn't want that to change. I'm going to fight to make sure it works for everyone. You should know this. They had a big, uh, they had a, uh, a series of big meetings uh, with the other CEOs, and they talked about some changes to capitalism. So this could uh, could work on the dispersion of uh, of wealth through the country. Pause I mean, it. So, uh, no, first of all. There was a CEO roundtable. Remember this was like three or four weeks ago where they're like, we should do more to uh, disperse the uh, money around the country. Poor Matt has had just a meltdown. Like, the, uh, like uh, you mean redistribution of uh, the CEOs? Oh, we can all, you know what we can all do? We can all go with a sacrifice, some type of maybe a human sacrifice to the uh, the council of CEOs to see if they'll give us more dispersion of uh, yeah, stuff. We have the technology for that. Yeah, the CEOs have had a meeting. They've already decided they're going to do more of this. What do we need anybody else to be rabble rousing? The dispersion of, uh, of wealth through the country. I mean, to vilify him or, or Wall Street does nothing but get the economy unwieldy about the prospect of Elizabeth Warren winning. You know, I don't understand how that message is going to, how she's doing so well with that message. That message is saying, you have more than I do. I want to take some of yours. I'm jealous of if what you have. If you don't have anything, that's a very potent message. Believe me. But that's not the American way. The American way is to work your tail off. But Keep you, working. Say yes. Say yes. Work weekends. Work nights. No, I, I, work I get your that, way but, to the top. But if you have worked really hard and you still don't have anything. I mean, you go to the I've been to the Bernie Sanders rallies where there are a lot of people who who need help. Uh, you know, they they uh, didn't have uh, health care that they, they need. Uh, you know, they got problems with uh, college tuition and things like that. And so for the Democratic message, look, you don't have any pause it. Just for, pause it. Look at the look on Brian Kilmeade's face and Ashley Ainsley's face. Look at look at the look on their faces. They look like that. Like, honestly, like they are being forced to watch their their pets being executed right now. They are so angry at this idea. And incidentally, the people that Ducey are talking about represent certainly a plurality, if not the majority of people in this country. I mean, we've all seen the reports that um, you're, you know, at least 50 percent of the country can't raise four hundred dollars in an emergency. And th according to Ashley Ainsley, 50 percent of the, I mean, those people just aren't working hard enough. You got to work 24 hours a day if you want to get health care. A lot of people who who need help. Uh, you know, they they uh, didn't have uh, health care that they, they need uh, you know, they got problems with uh, college tuition and things like that. And so for the Democratic message, look, you don't have anything. The government is going to make sure that the most successful people pay extra so you can get a hand up. That is very powerful. Right. And that's why, you know, you, you look at the number of people with that point of view. You add up all the people who support that. It's a big number. Right. I think that if you want to say CEOs get paid too much, I think you got a point. I mean, some of the money, some of the dollars and, others, and some other CEOs will turn around and goes, but that's you know how much I've generated for everybody? Right. That's right. a business decision. But if the business can afford to pay you, that's how capitalism works. Right. Uh, but if you have a board that you put on, you put that board in place and that board votes you a massive raise in incentives, yeah. that's when people were in 2008 focusing on. But 
here's the thing with Elizabeth Warren, <laughs> Steve, you're right. Mass market, there's more people without than with. I get it. But in the big picture, um, by continuing to go after the wealthy and the corporate tax cut, I think it's a dishonest approach to what is going to get her elected. Because in the end, she has a history of getting money from those corporations. All right. All right. All right. It's 7.07. <laughs> God. Wow, so many pivots. That one, that was like a, that was, like, you could see the producers in the control room going, guys, what are you doing? Guys, what are you, what's going on? What are, what, guy, what are you guys doing? What this is, what, what, what? We're supposed think they to get their talking points straight beforehand. Kilmeade ended up saying Warren was too far to the right. On That's Warren. right. He looped back around to oh, say, she, took she works warning. for corporations. It's especially insane because Elizabeth Warren. Bernie, Bernie. <laughs> He's like, <laughs> he rips Go. off his tie. Exactly. And Bernie like, shirt underneath. That was, that was uh, unbelievable. Like, it, it, like you wonder if they have like a debrief afterwards. They go down to the Fox commissary, a lot like what we do around here in the Majority Report. And they sit around. They go, guys, what could we have done better today? And you know, both Ashley and uh, Kilmeade are like, Steve, you can't. You can't say stuff like that. What are we supposed to do then? I, I get completely thrown off when you started talking about that. You, please don't do that anymore. Well, I went to the rallies. Please just don't do that anymore. It's, it's really obnoxious. It's really obnoxious. Well, you know, I saw a stat the other day saying that Bernie Sanders is more popular with Fox News viewers than MSNBC viewers. Right. So maybe this is a little bit of why. That's not uh, that's not terribly surprising. That's not surprising. Just just Steve, just don't do it anymore. OK. All right. I was just I was just trying to make conversation. Um, meanwhile. Folks, if you want to uh, tune in to uh, Seb Gorka on his um, on his YouTube channel, I'm afraid you cannot. Um, Seb Gorka has a radio show, and uh, it's The War for America's Soul. Oh, no, that's his book. I'm sorry. And he has well, all his pictures back. They all do that. They all put the pictures of the squad and Bernie Sanders on their books and their ads and stuff like that. Um, and uh, what is there, is there audio here? Or is it just? Yeah, this will be a little bit sped up so we can avoid. Oh, point. yeah. OK, so the Seb Gorka has been um, playing Imagine Dragons. <laughs> I'm not even. Sure. It's a great band. It's a, a, a tremendous band, uh, but apparently the lead singer of this band, Dan Reynolds, um, has been calling on Gorka to stop using the band's music since August. And on live radio, you can't. There's really no like you know like I remember Chrissy Hine wanted to do this. The Pretenders wanted to get um, Limbaugh to stop using her music. But what you can do is go to YouTube and say, dudes, you can. Uh, copyright violation, multiple, flagrant, scofflaw. Here's Seb Gorka's uh, show when it used to be on YouTube. Greetings, friends. <laughs> I have one thing to say, and I may say it for the next three hours. Unleash the Kraken. <laughs> there you are. Oh my God. That gets him so hyped, you could tell. I thought he was going to say, like, I am radioactive. I'm on radio and I'm active. There I'm is, imagining dragons. There is not a funnier band for him to have gotten in trouble for than <laughs> Imagine Dragons. <laughs> I don't. I this don't. is like a well. Glenn Beck got in trouble for playing Muse. Muse got upset. Is it? Are they like a kids band? Like Imagine Dragons? Yeah, they're sort of like a. Yeah, I think they. No, are. it's like a mainstream butt rock kind of band. You might hear them at a football stadium. Yeah, okay. they they like get played in car commercials and stuff like. that. Yeah, I was gonna say it's like that. I I I guess I associate that with kids music because whatever Saul wants to listen to music, all he wants to do is listen to the Ninjago soundtrack. And that's what it's, it reminds me of. I mean, they do it's encourage the you worst to that's uh, also a great use soundtrack. your imagination. Ninjago. Imagine Dragons. It does sound like a twee kind of like child pop band. 
I got into them because I often imagine dragons. I, I, um, I, th- this is uh, a little bit uh, interesting to me. I was on uh, Jared Holt's uh, podcast the other day. Um, what, what's uh, what's the name of his uh, his podcast? Is um, God, it slips my head. Um, but he is uh, from uh, Southern. What is it? Shitpost. Shitpost. The and podcast is from um, Southern Poverty Law Center. He follows all these right wingers, basically. Um, and um, one of the things that we were talking about was there is. It's hard to know whether you know, like, how these things work, but there has been like some sense that a lot of these figures are trying to get back into the mainstream and reposition themselves for this upcoming general election. You have Milo Yiannopoulos outing Richard Spencer. Did we play that audio? No. Wait, he outed Richard Spencer as a racist? Well, I mean, the fact that he did it, the fact that he did it was a way of making it seem like I'm not like this guy. Mike Cernovich re um, branding himself as a documentary filmmaker, Ugh. joining the IDW and trying to to, to be uh, Gavin McGinnis when he was doing that last summer was trying to be a moderate. He's just a moderator because he's so moderate that he could be a moderator of a debate between me and someone on the right because he's mo- he's a moderator. He's a moderate and. Turning Points USA, of course, has had a lot of problems with racism in the past. They've had numerous chapters that they've had to jettison. Uh, There were chats back and forth, anti-Semitism too. I think I remember one quote on one of their chats in one of their chapters was like, you know, don't hate Jews for no reason. Um, And uh, and of course, the right has not been... um, terribly uh, welcoming to gay people, specifically that they would have rights in the form of marriage equality. That has changed. They lost that fight, and now they have basically transferred it on to uh, transgender people. Um, It really is just they have just a new, it's just a, uh, you know, they have this sort of like one size fits all, and they just dropped it on somebody else. And now, now, Turning Points USA is getting trolled by some of their own sort of purity testers. It's basically the dynamic that's going on there. But on the right, they use it to moderate themselves on some level. Um, And I think that's, you know, part of what's going on here. Why, you know, um, why you have Charlie Kirk on a stage that says culture war and he is brought on um, a, a black guy who is gay, I guess, to argue that like they're, you know, they're, they're with it. We're with the young people now. And they were interrupted by what are known as groipers. And I don't know uh, what, what I that... thought those only existed on the internet. It's a, Pepe related sort of imagery. It's, yeah. These are basically um, the alt-right and uh, fundamentalists. Um, and there's this guy, Nick Fuentes, is that his name or something like yeah. that? Who is like one of these uh, new guys who are trying to make their, their name in it. And uh, so this went down. And what's fascinating to me is both um, how much I think Charlie Kirk likes this because it repositions his group as not being uh, like these people. But also the the inability for this guy who's being attacked to respond in a way that um, he feels like he has to justify his presence there by by. Well, watch this. This is at Ohio State University uh, just a couple days ago. How does anal sex help us win the culture war? I'm going to let the gay man answer that. Wait a minute, wait a minute. So can I I ask you a question? 
can you have the balls to ask the gay man on the stage that question and don't sure. defer to him? If so you, ask so so, so yeah. ask me that question. I will answer you that question. How so does? I'm gonna, no, no, no. I'm gonna answer you. You already asked the question, so I'm gonna answer that question. I'm gonna ask you that question. This is America. This is the greatest freaking nation in the world. We realize that America is great because we have Western values. We realize that, no, no, let me finish, dude. We realize that gays and lesbians are able to contribute to American society in the same way that everybody else is. And let me tell you, and let me tell you, when you continue doing that, okay, you realize that we are here. We are able to do everything. And let me tell you something as well. I served in the military, right? I served five years. I did an Iraq turn. What's up? How does homosexual sex help us win the culture war? Who said homosexual sex helps you win the that culture war? That is the question that I'm asking. Why are you promoting it? Well, it's a, it's a BS question, and you know it is. It's, not, it's, it's a question that is not, so be, no, it's not, it's not a good faith question. So I'm it's gonna a, be, it's, dude, I'm it's gonna not be a good faith question. Rob, like, honestly, I don't care what two consenting adults do. So that's that's the whole thing. And and your 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 hyper focus on it is kind of weird. Thanks. For I mean, being you here. seem to be you seem to be really interested in gay sex. I'm pretty sure if you're if you're into that, you can. Yeah, it goes on to say if you're into that, you can find somebody. Now, here's I got another answer for you. If you want to know how um how anal sex or promoting anal sex will help you uh, win the culture war, because young people who determine the culture doing mad butt stuff have no right uh are uh if they're not into butt play they're butt play friendly but no but more than that it's like um wake up and smell the coffee the culture that you're defending uh belongs in the dark ages and frankly if you look around at your fellow americans if you want to win the culture war you got to be on the side that's winning and that is where people do not um need even to say that gays and lesbians contribute to the American ideal. You, or, who cares? They don't have to contribute to the American ideal any more than uh, non-gays and non-lesbians. The bottom line is, you want to win the culture war? Get with the culture. The culture is, we realize there's no problem. You're living in the dark ages. But it's, it's, it's weird on some level because the guy doesn't feel confident enough in saying that. Yeah. Right? I mean, he feels like he has to and he's and he's right. I think that guy was in pretty good faith actually yeah. when he was asking that question. That that question was totally in good faith. In fact, even when Charlie um uh Kirk came up with the sort of like I don't care what happens with two consenting adults, but of course, of course he does. Right. Like, because there's other things that they has issues with. It's just that he knows that this is a this is a political issue that he's going to lose on when he's trying to deal with college kids. Um, even the smattering of applause you get in that room is indicative of why that guy feels self-conscious -con uh, about trying to answer this question. What is the move here? Like. Has Trumpism really decreased so much in popularity that these far right figures are now running to the center? I don't. I mean, I don't think they're running to the center. It's good for plausible. But I will they tell sound you, like liberals. Here's my predict. Here's my prediction. If Trump loses, we're going to be doing a lot more libertarian debates. Uh, one. That's the way this goes. Oh boy. That's the way this goes. It's going to be a lot more. One note on the Milo thing. I would uh, give him the same challenge I'd give to the never Trump Republicans, which is that if you really want to help out, start publishing. I mean, that's a start, right? The leaked audio of Richard Spencer Bean, how we all expect him to be behind uh, you know, closed doors. But how about like correspondence with Robert Mercer or things like that? Like publish all of those receipts. And then because Stephen frankly, Miller. if I turned on the left, I would be publishing all sorts of like emails from Michael and stuff like that. Right? From Michael? Or or from you or from all you people. Wait, what are the emails you would publish from me? I have some good stuff probably. Are you serious? No, I don't know. But <laughs> from Michael, yes, not from me. But hey, like take it, good care of this one. That would be where the value would be, right? Like, I don't know. Right. Yeah. Put your money put your former mouth where your money is. I don't well, know. hopefully this is a sign that the Overton window is shifting a bit at least, so that 
don't know, maybe someday the Democratic Party will realign itself into a workers party and the Republican Party will be where the Democrats are now. No, I would look to be a Turning Points USA to be a, a pro-gay, uh, sort of very border fascist party. In yes. The, for the next 20 years. Yes. Probably right. That's, I mean, that's all we're, we're, we're going to see. It's just a, they just keep retreading the same stuff over and over again and rebranding it. That is basically um, the way this goes. Let's go to the phones. Call them from a 702 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hey, Sam. It's Bro Flamingo from Las Vegas. Bro Flamingo from Las Vegas. How are you, sir? I'm all right. How you doing, guys? Everybody's fine, I guess. <laughs> What's on your mind? Uh... First of all, um, really interesting interview of, uh, with the, the gentleman's name, but we talking about Clarence Thomas. Yeah, that Corey was Robbins. really insightful. You know? Corey yeah. Robbins, yes, it was very insightful. Very, uh, it, was, it was a deep dive. Um, I just want to kind of rip on two things real quick. First thing, um, you know, because look, we saw Nancy Pelosi out there slinging, slinging the corporate moderate swap, and then on the, in the New York Slimes, you had the New York Slimes. They had Stephen Ratner. And Nate Cohn just just, just writing just the, just the worst articles that I read. You know, Nate Cohn, the, the one the one the, with Nate Cohn, they're pushing you know five thirty eight poll tested, talking about these swing moderates. And you guys really talked about it today. But in the New York Times, they're just talking about you know there's these swing voters. These people, they're marginal. Who cares? Literally, just who cares? Because they're talking about like you know it might be the black or Latino voter who doesn't care about Donald. Who I mean. We don't like the Democrats, but, you know, they might like Donald Trump. It's just like these, these such, so narrow slices of people that, like, why is this even an article? Like, really valuable space about something that could really do something. And Stephen Ratner, let's say about that bastard, the better. He's, he's attacking Warren. Look, I'm a birdie guy. But, you know, Stephen Ratner going after Warren, you know, her proposals are too big, you know, and, you know, big government. Jesus Christ, where did he get these people from? Well, it's I'll really tell you something. They, uh, I think you're going to see that stopping. They, it's no coincidence that we're hearing this for the first time now. It's because they thought that Bernie's campaign was faltering and that she was ascendant. And now they're going to ha- they're going to have to pivot back to attacking Bernie because they're they, I mean, this is it is I've always been of the mind that it was helpful to both of them to have them both in the in the race and more uh, than helpful to them as individuals, but to the left, because right. we're, we're, you're not giving uh, those, uh, you know, CNBC billionaires the opportunity to attack one of them specifically. Right. And, and to your point, Sam, I'll go to the second point. It's just that, you know, I'm starting to realize these guys really have nowhere to go. And, and you know, and, and they kind of have the false choice of booty jets because everybody knows in the back of their mind, booty jets is DOA. You know, especially with, with, with the uh, with the with the um, cover up in um, South Bend with, with the with the racist police chief, you know, and all the trash down there. And then he has no traction with black voters. This guy is a completely astroturfed up. It, it, it's kind of fun seeing, you know, the mainstream can't get their bearings straight. But, you know, at the same time, the, the, the trash that they're just putting out there, it's utterly disgusting. And I got one more point, Sam. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the Harriet movie just came out. And, you know, this is kind of in the weeds. But I, I would especially like Jamie's take on this. Cause... So in the Harriet movie, Sam, you know, you're a Jewish man. I'm a black man. So, you know, but one thing, you know, you guys have the Holocaust. We have slavery. I, I, I don't mean to put it in such blunt terms like that. But, you know, this movie... This movie really whitewashes slavery, you know, and they have like, and, and one of the main antagonists of the movie is, 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 a, is a black bounty hunter going out to Harriet. You know, it wasn't the slave masters or, you know, it wasn't, you know, the, the, the Confederate trash. It, it was the black bounty hunter pursuing her, pursuing her. And this is somebody who should be revered. It's, it's an American hero as a black person, also as a woman. This, this woman is very powerful. And at the end of the movie, she's, She's about to, she's, she's in a, she's about to die. You know, she's, she's in a precarious position. And whoa, spoiler alert. Whoa, 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 yeah. Uh, people haven't seen it. Harriet Tubman died? Uh, but the thing is, though, the, the thing is, though, the, 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 some of the narratives of this movie are awful because they just whitewashed a lot of things about slavery. You know, they gave, they gave like, for example, this isn't really a spoiler, but, you know, it was known, it was known that you know, Harriet had seizures and brain damage because of uh, an overseer dropped a weight on her head, you know what I'm saying, during, during, during her work, I mean, during her work, during uh, yeah. slavery. 
in this movie, this might even address, it, it, it just shows that she has a like superpower, like superpower, divine clairvoyance and stuff. To me, this is like insane. I, I don't know why. Yeah, I mean, crazy. I got to be honest with you. I mean, well, first off, I, I haven't seen it. I don't know much about it at all, but I will say this, that like my experience with these like type of biopics are always problematic. Uh, I think okay. they're always okay. problematic because um, they're, they're, you know, I, I just think that they, 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 they almost definitionally cannot do justice of, uh, to uh, a subject. And, um, and yeah, the idea that the, the, the sort of like the broad theme is that like, oh yeah, uh, uh, black guys were uh, the bounty hunters. That's the dynamic. It was all, it was a lot of black on black crime type of situation. Right. I, I right, mean, I get exactly. that. All right, listen, I, mean, I, I gotta jump. I appreciate movie, the call, but though. I'm never surprised when a Hollywood movie spreads bourgeois ideology. Yeah, it's. It, I mean, I had the same problem. Well, not the same problem, but a, a similar problem with Vice too. It's just like you're reducing things in such a way that 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 I understand it's necessary, but it it's problematic. I think to the conception of history. I mean, you know, and the same thing with you mentioned the Holocaust. Like you know, when the Holocaust series came out when we were when I was kids. And people are like, oh, yeah, Holocaust. I saw that. And I didn't. Call him from the uh, 484 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hello? 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 Am I on? Yes, you are. Who's this and where are you calling from? What? Hey, Sam. This is Nicole from Allentown, Pennsylvania. Nicole from Allentown, Pennsylvania. What's on your mind, Nicole? Oh my gosh, I was the one that sent the dollar ninety nine thing in today saying talking about a phone call. Anyway, so um I just wanted to say something about uh well actually what he was saying, Mike, was absolutely true. We definitely swept in Allentown on the Democratic side. So um I I really think that it's looking good for Bernie over here. However, I noticed that in my day to day, I find a lot of Trump supporters still out here, and I just I I try to like separate myself emotionally from these people who just can't seem to see like what is in store for the United States if this continues. Like, I think separating yourself sense? emotionally is probably a very healthy thing to do uh, from those people because it's I, they're not going to go away and. Certainly in Pennsylvania, there's a uh, majority of um, it's a majority of of the people, uh, at least that voted in the last election. So I would not be um, I would not be surprised. I I mean, I wish I had a better answer for you. But um, yeah, I, I mean, look, we just played that clip of of swing voters in Pennsylvania and right. they all said they they are convinced that they want compromise. Now, I suspect that they want to be able to say those words, but they don't actually want compromise. No, they want other people to compromise right. with them. That's right. They, exactly. exactly. Because From it, their standpoint, I sure. Think, I think if you were to go further with them, you would hear them say, we are oppressed. And yeah. we are put upon and made to feel like less than because of our views. And that is not a compromise. People need to let us have our perspective without crit criticizing us. And that's what they mean yeah. when they say they want compromise. Because there's no way sure. you can say, I want compromise. And then simultaneously, seconds after that, say, Donald Trump is not divisive. You just, it's not. You understand, is this crazy? This is lunacy that people are able to like, are able to function to thought processes like simultaneously in the same direction as that. Does that make sense? Like, like yeah. that they can think those, uh, on is, those two similar lines, but they're just so far apart from each other. It's completely it's like, incoherent. Where are you from? Where, where are you mean. from? Like, do you not have eyeballs and are able to see like all of the pain that's uh, around us? Like I can like, like, like talking about like being empaths, like I walk around and I feel these like people's pain, like especially in Allentown, there are so many people that are oppressed and walking around with shopping carts and, and have nothing. I mean, 
I mean, I have this thing. It's a Facebook post for helping people in Lehigh Valley. Like, I'm like, I'm, uh, can I hold somebody with a Thanksgiving dinner? I mean, I can't tell you how many people in an hour responded because they don't have money to provide a Thanksgiving dinner for their family. Like, I just don't understand how these people are so far removed and okay with that. It's just scary. It's really scary for for my children. I'm scared. I just... It's it's hard to, to witness this. You well, know? well, you know what? I think some people are very good at disconnecting the personal from the political, right? Like maybe some of them might give to charity, but they wouldn't think twice about supporting policies that lead to poverty and misery on a mass scale. And, and I mean, it's kind right. of analogous to like people who say, oh, uh, like... They don't think of themselves as racist and they might not be interpersonally racist, but they still have no problem supporting extremely racist policies and they don't make that connection. Well, yeah. Nicole, right. uh, hang in there and uh, hope springs eternal. You know, there was good news this week and uh, hopefully we'll have more uh, in the in the coming months. And, you know, um, I, you know I just want to say one more thing. Go ahead. Can I say one more thing? I just want to say one more thing about the Bernie Sanders campaign thing. Um, I, I I noticed like that, you know, we're talking about how Biden's second choice is is is, is primarily Bernie Sanders, right? So you know, my question is like, how do you think that um, without uh, without giving over to the center or any of our convictions, do we continue to reach those second voters that are? looking at Bernie. Those Biden and, voters who, who see Bernie as the second choice. I, I think there is a way correct. to do that. And that is to um, to get Biden, to show that Biden can't win. And, right. and or, or to undercut the notion that he's the only one who's a sure thing to win. And I think the way that that happens, frankly, is... Um, letting him talk. Is Well, it's letting him talk, but it's also... <laughs> Like when he loses in, in Iowa and when he loses in New Hampshire, bring that question up. Like, how does a guy right. who is going to beat Donald Trump, right? How does that guy lose Iowa? Barack right. Obama didn't lose Iowa. Let's let's be clear here. Barack Obama, Barack Hussein Obama, the first black man to become president won Iowa and Joe Biden who is a shoe in to beat Donald Trump can't win in Iowa can't even win. what right. it doesn't make any sense that's that's right. what I will be saying appreciate the call Nicole yeah solidarity yeah, hang in there all right we don't have much time for uh many more calls uh people have been hanging on for quite a while Calling from an 812 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Me? Yep. Who's this? Hey, uh, this is Chris from Texas. Chris from Texas. What's uh, on your mind? Got to be quick. Yeah, I'm going to read a quick question and then I'll hop off. Okay. So I think you can explain Bernie's appeal simply. He addresses people's material needs. That's kind of it. And I want to hear all your opinions here. Because it's kind of baffling to me. What is the appeal of Andrew Yang? My suspicion is when you ignore the damning critiques from the left, and especially Richard Wolf, uh, UBI would be an unmeans-tested universal service from government, and maybe Yang supporters, especially disillusioned young people on Reddit, feel that they aren't accustomed to tangible universal benefits. And my second guess is maybe Yang's brand of what he calls human-centered capitalism is appealing to people who still want to believe in all of our cultural myths about markets. But the fact is, with Bernie, we'll all have more money in our pockets than with Yang. We'll right. have actual medical... Okay, I, I, we get all. the gist. We get the gist. I appreciate the call. Um, right. I, I, I mean, I don't know that we all have to answer this. I mean, let's be honest for a second. He's, he's polling at 3%. So I mean, it's not like there's this wide, the, you know, and the idea that there are three percent of people out there who really like the UBI, who are libertarian leaning, so they they but they also um, have some type of social conscience, 
this fulfills all that stuff. And it makes it seem like you don't have to get into, you know, the messy areas and you don't have to have, uh, you know, uh, welfare uh, and you don't have to have a safety net and society doesn't have to like be too engaged in making sure that everybody's there. You can just sort of like do it all through the marketplace. I mean, it has some allure. The I, I would be surprised if it didn't garner 3% of interest. And it seems like people are coming at it from a lot of different angles, right? Because there are the people who just think, oh, wow, a thousand bucks a month in my pocket would really change things for me. But I think the vast majority of those people would rather go with Bernie because they see that his programs would help them a whole lot more. And like, even if you want to translate it into dollars, it would be more money for them. Um, and there are also people who think about the UBI like, I mean... Here, here's the thing, is that I think at the end of the day, there are people, and I think the guy's right. I mean, I think he answered his own question. People want to believe that the markets, uh, you know, the, the, the markets and the, um, uh, essentially the, um, the, the private markets are actually effective and work. And the only thing that we need to do is give more people more chits in that market. But we have seen this, we, the problem with, with uh, health insurance in this country is not that People don't have enough chits. It's that the, that it's broken. It's dysfunctional. So it doesn't really matter. You give everybody else an extra thousand dollars. It's just eventually it's just going to get sucked up into the machine. Yeah, it's the same thing with housing, right? Yeah. Like giving people an extra thousand bucks a month isn't going to change the underlying reasons why the rent is going up exponentially. Call from a 502 area code. Who's this? Where you call from? We get time for one or two more. Sam, can you hear me? Yes. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Got to be quick. This is Ryan from Louisville. Ryan from Louisville. Big win uh, last night. Uh, all right. So, Matt Evans, yeah. he didn't win the election, but he did call for a recount. Uh, um, huh? Yeah. Okay. Um, but Andy Bashir won. Do you think that McConnell will lose the Senate seat because of the higher turnout in Kentucky? Um, if I had to bet, if I had to bet my kid's college fund, I would say, no, he's not going to lose. Okay. But I think that it's not as absurd of a premise as it might have been. Let's put it that way. I mean, look, there's a lot. Let, let's put it this way. And I appreciate the phone call. The If you look at the 2016 election, there was a lot of factors that needed to line up for that to happen. For Hillary Clinton to lose three states by a total of 70,000 votes. There was a lot of, lot of factors that needed to happen before one of those straws broke the camel's back. What we saw last night in Kentucky is a straw on the back that could break Mitch McConnell. There have to be other straws. And I don't know which straw that, I mean, look, the impeachment thing could in some way blow up in, in, in Mitch McConnell's face, right? I mean, who knows, but it is one other straw on that back. Is there enough straws right now? I don't think so, but a lot of things can happen in a year and, um, you know, you think of all the things that made it possible for Comey's letter to switch the election. You think of all the things that made it possible for Clinton not going to Wisconsin and Michigan to swing the election. You look at all the things that are possible that... Decades of failed neoliberal policies. We, yes, all the things that that are um, that that are possible that that could have that impacted that election. This is just one more uh, with Mitch McConnell. Now, Mitch McConnell has um, failed neoliberal policies as well, uh, <laughs> but I think the idea that uh, more people are coming out and hate Donald Trump is 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 driving a lot of those voters in that state. 
Oh, yeah. I mean, the class character of Kentucky is also different than some other states that we might be talking about, right? Because there's so much poverty and there is a very radical history there. And it used to be a blue state until fairly recently. So I don't think we should be fatalistic about the possibilities going forward. I, I mean, I think it's, I mean, it's, let me put it this way. It's more, if you had called two days ago, it's more possible uh, today than it was, uh, I, I would rate it as more possible today than I would have rated it two days ago. Call from a 484 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hey, Sam. It's Mitch from uh, the Poconos in Pennsylvania. Mitch from the Poconos, of course. What's on your mind, Mitch? <laughs> I was hoping I was going to have some more time to talk about this because Mike didn't touch on it. But uh, in Pennsylvania, we voted on the ballot uh, a question today for Marcy's Law as an amendment to our Constitution, and uh, it passed overwhelmingly. Now, uh, the issue is that this law is, uh, one, it's a constitutional amendment that, that makes it very difficult to undo. Uh, and two, it's, uh, it, it undermines the due, pro- like due process for, uh, for defendants in, in criminal cases by giving victims the, the like, extra victim rights, they call it, uh, but the the courts yesterday before the before the election said that they won't be counting the votes until they determine if it's uh, constitutional. Uh, the main reason is because when amending the constitution, you have to vote on only one thing at a time, and I think they stuck like eight things in there, so it probably won't won't pass. But uh, okay. this is it, this, this is, is something. Hey, bud, I'm sorry. This is something for another. We're we're up against it, and it's it's uh, this is a little bit too involved. Uh, to, to really follow with the way you're laying it out right now. But um, I appreciate the call. Let's do, uh, uh, let's try it another day. Um, all right. We got time for one more call. Call from a 206 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Patrick from Seattle. Patrick from Seattle. Yeah, I just want to let you guys know that I think the one still probably has a chance to get, uh, get up in here after the votes come in 4 p.m. West Coast. Um, but Tammy Morales, which is another person that Bernie had spoken of, uh, overhandedly won her race. Right. Uh, so not all is lost. Fantastic. All right. Well, that's good to know. We will um, we will uh, w- we'll look for updates uh, in the coming days. Appreciate the call. All right, folks. Sadly, that is all the time that we have. I know there's been people been hanging Ooh. on the phones for quite a while. Uh, maybe, I don't know what we can do. Maybe, maybe we'll do like a, I don't know. I don't know what the answer is. I really don't. Uh, just keep on taking calls tomorrow. Keep on taking calls tomorrow. We could get less popular. Keep on keeping on. Concerted effort to lose fans. Maybe make the show just a little bit more exclusive. We used to make the show very exclusive, but we opened it up a little bit. So folks. See you tomorrow. It might take all the strength I got To get to where I want But I know somehow I'm gonna get there I wasn't looking when I just got caught Between the truth and the light bar But finding out won't make me feel any better yeah, I know the clock is ticking, but the meds are gonna kick in, and my pilot light shining bright. I guess I'm where the choice was made, for the option where you don't get paid, for the road that bends before it finally breaks you. I guess somehow I lost my drive Between the 101 and the 5 Do you know how far the detour takes you? Yeah, I know the clock is ticking But the meds are gonna kick in And my pilot light shining bright
shifted in and out. 